Since the start of creation of mankind, there has been a problem that has arisen, that of racism. It's very interesting that if you pick up Nahjul Balagha, you'll find the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, talking about an individual or a being as he refers to him being Imam al the leader of the racists or the negative biasness. And this is of course in relation to Iblis. The problem of thinking your race, family, lineage or nation is better than someone else's. Racism arises from ego and arrogance and it all started with Satan. Allah made it very clear. The first racist is Shaitan. Chapter 7 of the Quran says, Allah said, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? Satan said, I am better than him. You created me from fire and created him from clay. And therefore today, every single racist and every single individual who calls and practices form of racial prejudice is following in the footsteps of Satan. We are oppressed. We are exploited. We are downtrodden. We are denied not only civil rights, but even human rights. Prejudice and discrimination against different races rises from ignorance. No one is born racist. So why do they grow up to be racist? What drives a person to think that they are better than someone just because of their skin color? And I, for one, as a Muslim, believe that the white man is intelligent enough. If he were made to realize how black people really feel and how fed up we are without that old compromise and sweet talk, tell him how you feel. What factors influences an individual to become a racist because in this context we are discussing racism. Number one is environment. At the same time, uh, racism can be enforced by the media, stereotypes, personal experiences, or in fact, generalization. What does Islam say about racism? We know that the Prophet Muhammad peace and salutations be upon him and his progeny, lived in a difficult time. The aristocrats of Quraysh no doubt thought they were a class better than everyone else. Discrimination against non-Arabs was present. Yet, Islam was a religion that did not distinguish people according to their race. Islam from the outset makes clear that people come from different races and different tribes. There are even discussions concerning how prophets have gone to people of different races and different tribes, and therefore what differentiates human being is their level of awareness of God in their life. Islam wants us to have healthy relationship, healthy social interaction. One of the major cancer of social interaction is discrimination and racism and prejudice. When you read the Holy Quran, you have a verse that speaks of this in chapter 49, verse 13. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly addresses this topic. And one may argue that the vision of Islam is made clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nas inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ilan lita'arafu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female and made you nations and tribes so that you may know one another. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Prophet peace and blessings be upon him says something that truly should make all of us think. Anybody who on the day of judgment has an atom weight of racism or extremism in their heart God the Almighty resurrects them on the day of Qiyamah with the pagans at the time of the ignorant, the Jahiliyyah. The verse in chapter 49 is very clear. Made you tribes so that you may know one another. Islam actually wants the communities within Arabia and its outskirts to actually for the first time not look down at each other because of race or because of tribal background, but actually for the first time, try to sit together and get to know one another. Some of these Arabs, for example, would have never sat with an Abyssinian slave. And all of a sudden, 
they are seeing the emergence of Islam symbolized by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam who is sitting with a slave, eating with a slave and he is actually welcoming them and giving them a source of life and is acknowledging them. He is actually willing to acknowledge the humanity of the fellow citizens. He is not looking at the color of their skin or what tribe they are from or any labels they confess to. He is looking at them as his fellow human being. So this is to say there is no room within the religion of Islam for racism and discrimination. Then the second part of this holy verse says, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you, the one that has taqwa. Allah did not say the best amongst you is the Arab or the Persian or the Roman or the African. No, the best amongst you is the one who has taqwa because taqwa should ensure the eradication of those diseases which are causing you to hate or frown or look down at Allah's creatures. And another ayah which you know very well, Allah makes it very clear. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ Amongst the signs of Allah is the creation of the heaven and the earth. And he also said among the signs of Allah, because that word is harf al وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ And the differences in your tongues, meaning languages, and your skin colors. If we are going to live in our own bubble, then that's going to breed ignorance. It may also breed diseases such as arrogance and even ego. So much so that this arrogance may mean that we will look down on others. Within the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, not only did he talk the talk, but he also walked the walk in that he was exemplary in ensuring that if he saw any form of racism before him, if he saw any form of discrimination, he would correct it. In fact, he would be stern against it. What's even more interesting is that one may argue that the Black Lives Matter movement emerges in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace and salutations be upon him and his family. Where? I'll give you an example of the great companion of Rasulullah by the name of Juwaybar. Juwaybar, we can say, is a person who we can relate the Black Lives Matter movement to. He comes to the Holy Prophet, peace and salutations be upon him and his family, recognizing that first there's an outlet in which a person is able to voice their frustration because of racism in the community, because of racism that they are facing. And today we notice even that is not possible. Some people may face persecution, uh, may be forced into a corner where they can't even speak out, they can't even protest, they can't even have their voices heard. And on the second level, he notices that the members of his own religion, of his own community, are the ones who are racist. You can imagine that someone outside of your religion, outside of your community, outside of your circle is racist. But when the reality is that sometimes it may be someone who is a member of your own faith who displays racism towards you. And Juwaybar comes to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and salutations be upon him and his family, literally saying, my life matters, black lives matter. Here I am, a black member of the Muslim community and I can't even get married. So the Prophet looks at him and tells him, go towards Labid. Labid was this influential figure in a very high position in that community. And the Prophet tells him that go towards him and tell him, I have come to propose to marry your daughter. And the proposal comes with a reference from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and salutations be upon him and his family. Juwaybar was surprised, yet he followed the commands of Rasulullah. And so Juwaybar goes, knocks on the door, and the father comes out, says, can I help you? He says, this is a message from the messenger of God. That man looked at him and says, I respect the messenger of God, but we don't give our daughters except to people who are worthy at the same kind of level in society as us. As about when he was about to leave, Juwaybar looked behind 
and was somehow saddened. That was the moment where the daughter herself called out to her father, if Rasulullah is saying that I should marry this man, then who are we to object? We can say that Juwaybar leads the Black Lives Matter movement because what he is doing is coming to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam and saying, I have to do something about what's happening in my community. You, O Prophet of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, are the one who we find as an outlet because you have in the community amongst the Muslims, some who have envy and this envy begins to overtake you. And some of your racial deep feelings also emerge. For example, you have the Mu'addin, the Adhan reciter of the Holy Prophet وسلم, by the name of Bilal. And Bilal is a close companion of Rasulullah. And when he would recite the Adhan, the call of prayer, some of the Muslims were the ones who were like, why does he have this black slave reading the Adhan? And some of them would say, why isn't not us that's reading the Adhan? Why do we not have this position? Why is Bilal so close to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam? And some would even use foul language. Just imagine they are looking at this human being and not looking at him for his sincerity or his morality or for him being a human being. They're looking at what? His skin color. Bilal people laughed at Bilal because of his pronunciation. And people mocked because Bilal couldn't say Ashhad. Sheen was difficult for Bilal. Bilal would say Ashhad. And some of those Arabs who were there, they would laugh. Number one, with the skin color of Bilal. And number two, Ya Rasulullah, who are you making your mouth say? There's an interesting conversation that takes place between Umar ibn al-Khattab and Salman al-Muhammadi, a Persian person who has come towards the religion of Islam. And this conversation is narrated by many historians because he comes to this devout companion of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam by the name of Salman. And when you read the conversation, you noticed a sense of ego, arrogance that comes out. Omar begins to ask him some questions which definitely have a racial undertone. Now, here it is not a white vase black racism. It's an Arab vase Persian. Salman may be a bit darker in his skin color, but now you see this tribal racism emerge. And this exists as well in the time of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. So he comes towards Salman and he asks him, Salman, what tribe do you belong to? Because you've got these Arabs, when they talk to one another, they say, I belong to the tribe of Tamim, or I belong to the tribe of Adi, or Bani Rabi, and so on. So Salman is asked, what tribe do you belong to? So Salman answers in a way to say that this tribalism and this racism that exists where you grew up hasn't affected me. I was a slave and I became free through Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. Meaning I found freedom in Islam and Islam is my family. That's where my family is. And that's why later the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam says, Salman is from us, the Ahlul Bayt. And he is titled Salman Al-Muhammadi, not Salman Al-Farisi, Salman the Persian. So what you have was definitely a challenge for the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. A challenge that the Arabs in those days did not understand. Why is he friendly to these colored people? Or why is he friendly to this black slave? Why is he who is someone known to be an Arab from a famous tribe sitting with these lower class people? And this was a challenge in his community as there are many stories from Muslims, certain companions, racist against each other. And they are Muslims here. This is also seen in the time when the Holy Prophet has migrated to Medina. Not only seen in Mecca, but even in Medina, in his own mosque, this was seen. And this was not just the early days of Islam, where the community uh, suffered from this, but of course the community evolves. And we see that the Holy Prophet ﷺ tried his best to remove these diseases from the community 
and bring the Muslims together. What lessons do we gain when we study the life of the family of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his progeny? We hear of many great companions of Imam Ali, peace be upon him, and Imam Hassan and Hossein, peace be upon them. We read about these wonderful personalities and their characteristics. Part of the Prophet's mission was to purify the community that was steeped in a period of ignorance. Unfortunately, this disease of ignorance had affected some of these Arabs so much so that it was part of them now. Part of the Prophet's role is to purify them. And we read this in the Holy Quran, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, وَيُزَكِّهِمْ To try and get them to come back towards a path which did not have this arrogance. And of course, one may argue, these are the roots of racism today in society. Ahl al-Bayt also practically showed the way as to what we should do as Muslims and as the Alamis. First example is Lady Fidda. Lady Fidda was a lady or a lady of color. She was in the house of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen in Fatima al-Zahra alayhum as -salam. Look at how Amir al-Mu'mineen and baby Fatima cherished and honored Lady Fidda in that house. At Karbala, you have companions of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, from everywhere. There are examples of personalities alongside Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, who are personalities who become important in the discussion when we look at Black Lives Matter today. You have the famous companion, John. He has been around the household of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, for a very long time. He has been with Imam Ali alayhi salam, he's been with Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, and now he is with Imam al Hussein, peace be upon them all, in Karbala. And he plays a great role in this battle of Karbala, even at a very old age. Not only is he rising against oppression on the day of Ashura, there seems to be an element of him rising against what? Racism and making it clear that black lives matter on the day of Ashura. How, you may ask? Let's look at his words before he dies, his poetry. He says, how do the disbelievers, and he's talking to those that are fighting him. How do the disbelievers view a strike of a black? What is he saying? He's saying to the enemy, a lot of you are arrogant because of your skin color. A lot of you are looking down upon me because of my skin color. A lot of you and your forefathers were racist against Bilal. A lot of you are racist today. So he says, how do you view my strike on this day? I will use my sword to defend my master Hussein defend his family, defend the principles of his grandfather, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, the legacy of his grandfather, Muhammad. What legacy? That legacy of him trying to eradicate racism. I sacrifice myself in their mission with my tongue and with my hands. What does he say? All I want is to be with them in that heavenly abode. What was also interesting is that when it comes to the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them, many of their mothers were non-Arab. They were, of course, from Africa. They had the kind of African origin, 7th Imam, 8th Imam, 9th Imam, 10th Imam, 11th Imam, even possibly the 12th Imam. Their mothers were from African origin. And this was deliberately uh, the, the case because the Ahlul Bayt salam, wanted to shatter all kinds of racism and to say, look, if I can choose a wife that is non-Arab and not only a wife, but also a mother of an Imam who is chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is something that the Almighty is indeed pleased with. You notice the Imams who have companions who are known as Qummi. So they don't have just companions from Medina or from their own area. Sometimes in our mosques, you see us in categories, the Iraqi center, the Khoja center, the Pakistani center. 
the Lebanese center, the Iranian center. Imam has companions from all over the Muslim world. He has companions from Kufa. He has companions from Khorasan, from Qom, from Baghdad, from Yemen, from all over the Muslim world. What does this highlight? This highlights that the Imams fought against racism. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter where you are from. In the eyes of Allah, you are all his creation. Let us not forget that when you read history and you read the biographies of the Imams, the later Imams marry women from Africa. أشهد أنكم كنتم نوراً في الأصلاب الشامخة والأرحام المطهرة In the famous ziyaras, we read that O oh, Imams, you came from holy, pure wombs that carried you. Therefore, the Imam, when he's picking his wife, when he's picking that holy womb, that pure womb that will carry the next Imam, he doesn't say, I'm going to pick a woman from Medina or I'm going to pick a woman, for example, from my area, from my family, from my tribe, the same skin color as me. No, the Imam is saying, I'm going to pick a woman who is pure, who is holy. It doesn't matter where she's from. And that's why you see the later Imams marry women from Africa. In the front lines of what is now one of the most dangerous and controversial jobs in America, police work. 1607, 1654, Mitchell cover. 11, 10, from Officer Mark Blackwell knows the streets of Bridgeport, Connecticut well. He grew up not far from here in a family of cops. But in the wake of the Dallas ambush, this week feels different. Do you ever think it's open season on cops? Feels like a bullseye on our backs right now. We all want to be able to go home to our loved ones. A shared frustration over the rampant violence and needless loss of life. Black on black crime is, is out of control. There's a lot of people in this community that want to address that issue. They don't want to see their loved ones killed. You have to be scared when you do this job, but it's what we do to protect other people. In the twilight hours of our ride with Officer Blackwell, he takes us to a place he describes as one of the most dangerous housing projects in Bridgeport, where shootings are commonplace. I'm gonna be crap when I grow up. Instead of blood, we be? find hope. What are you gonna be? A cop. You want to be a cop when you grow up? Me too. You too? Me too. Hope that these young boys will never have to choose sides in a country seemingly divided between black and blue. The fact that racism continues today is a surprise, based on that humanity has progressed so much, especially in the last century. Yet, we still have a belief that one's own race is superior to another. And you will probably find a story in the news re-racism on a daily basis. The real question is what leads to racism. I can't even begin to describe or tell you the amount of times I've been racially profiled. First time it ever happened, I was seven years old, didn't even understand it. The second time it happened to me, I was 12 and then 14, and then 15, and then by 17, I had a gun pressed to my chest. But the worst one for me has always been Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old kid, a 12-year-old kid playing with a toy gun, and they shot him, and it's, and it's got to stop, and it, it's really got to stop. I think I've been silent for too long, and the, this is the first of many steps we've done. Uh, show my support, do what I can do, and use my wife. When we look around the world today, we find that there are countries that unfortunately have what is known as systemic racism, deeply embedded, rooted within institutions, within organizations, which within the way people are treated, based on their color, creed, religion, or indeed background. I don't think you can remove prejudice from human beings because we we'll always have this prejudice in us, going back to Shaitan's we mentioned before. But it's the power behind the prejudice. So I might not like another person because maybe he's got a better job than me or he's, he's taller than me or he's handsome. I may not want to marry my daughter to this particular person because he's not of my tribe. That's not necessarily a bad thing. 
but it's when you institutionalize it when you make it the modus operandi of the system that you're in that's the problem when you ask white English people about the nature of institutionalized racism, it's largely denied and, uh, and reduced. Uh, but in essence, you're asking a fish to explain water. It's all about its environment. It, it can't see it, but it's everywhere. It's like air. And that's the nature of institutionalized racism. Now, racism is defined in a political acumen as prejudice plus power. That means I may not like you, I may have a prejudice towards you, but I don't have the power to determine your job and where you live, um, you know, your educational uh, abilities. I don't have the power to carry it out, I might just dislike you. So, that, so you can have a racist, but racism is a systemic system, which means that you have the power to carry out your prejudice and to actually affect the life of another human being. On the 25th of May, George Floyd, 46, died after being arrested by police outside a shop in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mr. Floyd was arrested on suspicion of using a counterfeit note. Then, George Floyd was restrained by officers, while one of the officers placed his left knee between his head and neck. For seven minutes and 46 seconds, Mr. Chauvin kept his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck. Footage from nearby people show Mr. Floyd said more than 20 times he could not breathe as he was restrained. He was also pleading for his mother and begging, please, please, please. Let's get him get in the car. Mama. Get up and get Mama. in the car right. I can't. You can't get At one point, Mr. Floyd gasps, you're going to kill me, man. They will kill me. They will kill me, man. The death of George Floyd sparked protests in cities across the US and many parts of the world. Many calling for justice after the death of African-American George Floyd in police custody. It sums up 400 years of oppression, 400 years of feeling uh, disconnected, of being looked at in a, uh, in a negative way. And it sums up the fact that since my birth, I've not been able to breathe to, to a sigh of relief, to be able to live my life the way I want to live my life as a human being. So I, I can't breathe means, I can't breathe economically, socially, politically, religiously. It means I'm not able to be me. I'm not able to breathe freely. I can't breathe is now a way of actually experiencing and understanding what would it be like to be choked? What would it be like to be not to be able to breathe? Every human being can understand that. You know, when, you're, when, you, when you can't breathe, you have your life choked out of you and by, by an oppressive force. So that police officer represented the weight of racism, prejudice and evil, as we said, going back to Shaitan, of crushing the spirit and the humanity of a human being. So that was an example, a physical example of what it's like to be black in America, in New England and generally in the world. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Wherever we see injustice, whether it's George Floyd or even someone else, irrespective if they are our brother in faith or equals in humanity, as Imam Ali, peace be upon him, has said, any injustice we noticed, we must find a way to speak out against this injustice. We cannot simply just sit back and say, I did not know who George Floyd was. When a person says, and we hear his words, I can't breathe. When a person says, I am hungry. When a person says, I am thirsty. There are enough examples in our own Islamic history of people who said those lines of, I can't breathe, or I am thirsty, or I am hungry. And nobody was there to help them. Nobody was there to quench their thirst. Nobody was there to help them. If we are going to remain silent when we see injustice, then we have not understood the message of Islam. We have not understood 
the message of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. He came for the oppressed people. He came for the needy. So there is a need for us to try as much as possible to learn from the Holy Prophet. And we must follow in his footsteps. It doesn't matter who it is. We must stand up for all the oppressed and we must always speak up against injustice. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I think that this particular time it's been brought to a highlight with, you know, the tragic murder of George Floyd, George Floyd, and um, it's brought to a highlight. But it's only been, it's always been there. You know, it's just that it's been caught on film now. And with the use of technology and internet, etc., it's just another murder that's been caught on film. But millions of people are murdered for their race everywhere around the world or for their culture or their beliefs. You can spend your entire life firefighting individual fires and not laying a glove on the beast that is institutionalized racism. And it's only when you get into government that you can then begin to put in place some ameliorative measures, and they are only ameliorative. They only push the dial forward, but they don't fundamentally restructure society. Uh, uh, that is the only thing that could lead to its ultimate elimination. So even in government, we could only make things a little better in certain areas uh, uh, and uh, gave, give people a strong political lead that at least in our mayorality, we were committed to doing what we can where we could on combating institutionalized racism. But is it embedded in government? You betcha. England's defeat has sent an expectant nation into mourning, but a minority of fans resorted to creating trouble. Three English players have been targeted with racist abuse on social media following their miss in the penalty shootout. Institutional racism, also known as systemic racism, is a form of racism that is embedded as normal practice within society or an organization. It can lead to such issues as discrimination in criminal justice, employment, housing, healthcare, political power and education, among other issues. Racism of this kind, racism that infects the very structure of our society, is systemic racism. And at a glance, it may be difficult to detect. Since the election of Donald Trump, hate crimes have been on the rise. White supremacists have been emboldened. Anti-immigrant rhetoric has intensified. Many have condemned these awful examples of prejudice and bias and hate. But systemic racism is something different. It's less about violence or burning crosses than it is about everyday decisions made by people who may not even think of themselves as racist. As sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva has said, the main problem nowadays is not the folks with the hoods, but the folks dressed in suits. Systemic racism persists in our schools, offices, court system, police departments, and elsewhere. But why is this? Some experts say that when white people occupy most positions of decision-making power, people of color have a difficult time getting a fair shake, let alone getting ahead. White privilege and white supremacy remains unchallenged uh, uh, in, in the global discourse. And I think that uh, the, uh, uh, the appearance of equality uh, can't be assumed because we have 
more black and brown faces on football teams or on the television. Because in reality, if you're a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi Muslim, if you're an Afro-Caribbean baby in your first year of life, you're still twice, three, four times less likely to survive your first year of life than if you were a, a white a white baby here in Britain. If you are from any of those ethnic groups, you're still likely to be more unemployed, uh, more likely to be unemployed uh, than not. If you're from those ethnic groups, you're more likely to receive specific racial and ethnic profiling on your communities that will lead to the criminal of your young people uh, than others. So whilst they offer up this sort of mosaic of progress in the name of diversity, structural racism and real racial inequality and religious discrimination has seen growth, not, 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 not uh, uh, diminish. Why does Black Lives Matter and why doesn't all lives matter? Well, all lives will matter when black lives do matter. And currently they don't. So until they do, all lives can't matter. By default, that must be an incorrect statement and an illogical statement. When all lives are valued equally, then all lives will matter and will be part of a common humanity. Until some lives are valued more than others, then black lives will, uh, you know, do matter. Black lives matter because the systemic brutality of racism has affected black people more than any other person. According to one study in the United States, white families hold 90% of national wealth, while Latino families hold 2.3%, and black families hold 2.6%. That means for every $100 white families earn in income, black families earn just $57.30. That's a huge racial justice issue. In other stats, in education, when all groups are examined, black students are over three times more likely to be suspended than white students, even when their infractions are similar. Overall, black students represent 16% of student enrollment and 27% of students refer to law enforcement. And once black children are in the criminal justice system, they are 18 times more likely than white children to be sentenced as adults. There are many other studies that show the poor housing issues of non-whites, as well as many studies showing the criminal injustices against black African Americans. For example, when black people are convicted, they are about 20% more likely to be sentenced to jail time, and typically see sentences 20% longer than those for whites who were convicted of similar crimes. The point of the matter is, black lives matter because the world saw a black male for eight minutes beg for his life, beg for his mom who's dead. He defecated himself and urinated himself and vomited live. He was lynched. And lynching is in the history of America. Lynching and violence is as American as apple pie. And black people have suffered, particularly black males, since we were bought from Africa, the plantation system was to destroy the black man, to make sure he can't be a man to his family, he cannot protect his family. And they've used economic, social, and political institutions to cripple the black family and to cripple the black man. So black men now will be reduced most time to living out a life of crime or, or not being able to fulfill their potential. Lately, some speakers and scholars in the Muslim Shia community have spoken about racism within our communities. Some have spoken of their own experience, while others have spoken about the racism they have witnessed. The question arises, is our community racist? Do black lives matter in Islam? Let's not be naive. Ultimately, racism exists in every community. And without a shadow of a doubt, it exists in the Muslim community as well. Yes, it's a very important point that we understand that um, there's a difference between Islam and the difference between Muslim. And this is very important because in Islam, there is no color distinction. A man is based on his character and his spiritual connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas uh, Muslims may fall short of manifesting that truth. There's racism, yes, in the Muslim community. 
I have felt the racism myself. You know, again, mixed race, mixed diverse, going into different centers and having been able, alhamdulillah, to go to different centers to speak. I've heard comments. I've seen the way that I have been treated. I felt it myself and words that are even used in, in communities that even growing up, you feel like you don't belong. And I see it with my own eyes, the way that some of our revert community are treated in our centers, the way that they are shunned, the way that when programs are finished and the chai is served, the little groups, the little baraza groups form and they're left on their own. For example, many black Muslims like myself have for decades been saying to the existing Islamic communities, which are predominantly non-black, that we are suffering racism. And yet we get sh shut down by being told, yeah, but Bilal was black, Malcolm X is black. Um, you know, don't talk about this, this is, this is anti-Islamic. And ha you know, we shouldn't discuss these things, we're not the West. So my, firstly, my reaction to kind of any racist comments in my life is to ignore it, pretty much. I felt racism, systemic racism all my life, all of my life. Um, so if I go back to sort of my childhood, um, growing up in my culture, in, in, my, in my Swahili tongue, there's a word called Mzungu, Gora in Urdu. Now these words were thrown at me. So, so much so that when I was young, I actually thought my nickname was Mzungu, which means foreigner white guy, basically. There are different forms of racism happening within our communities. Yes, the first one is individual racism. We do have individuals within our communities across the globe, individually who are racist, whether from Arab to Blacks, or from Arabs to Asians, or from Asians or to Blacks, or Blacks to Asians, you know, it's cut across, Habibi. We have it. There is individual racism, which is more. Now, when we talk of systematic racism, systematic racism has two wings, either institutional or structured. So when you talk of institutional racism, it's when you have people who are in leadership position are racist. And when you talk of structured, it's like the operation of a particular system. Yes, we have it within our communities. Sometimes it's in a very subtle way, in a very mild way. And people don't take notice of that. But the victims are able to take notice of it. So yes, I'm not going to sit here and lie. We do have racism within our communities without a shadow of doubt. So when somebody becomes Muslim, a black person, there's no support for them. You have to go back into, basically we're with non-Muslims all the time because we haven't got a link with the existing community because our family's not Muslim, our friends are not Muslim, um, you know, our services are not Muslim. So what do you do if you're, if you're a black Muslim and you become Muslim? You took your shahada that day, but then you're, you're like a fish now that, you know, you, you took it, you was taken out of the water and you're flopping about, but you're gonna go back into the water now because there's nothing else for you. And also as well, you know, the burial situation. What happens when, you, when someone gets buried? It's, if you're not of that community, they're not going to bury you. Because they've got burial services only for people of their community. So even in death, there's this <laughs> separation. We as Muslims, as well as followers of the Ahl al-Bayt, have been victims of dehumanization. We have been people who have been subjected to all kinds of terrorism and Islamophobia, as well as Shiaphobia. We should know very well that forms of racial prejudice, injustice, social oppression that exists out there is unacceptable. And that we must all be working together to try and identify areas within our practices, within our thoughts that we must reform. It is easy to be afraid of social reform. It is easy to be offended and be somehow defensive of oneself if somebody questions the existence of racism within our own communities. And the reason for that, the truth hurts. I think each person needs to ask themselves, 
Are they following in the true teachings of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family? It simply starts with each individual. It makes me feel sad. It makes, it, it, it's hurtful. It pains my heart. It actually, uh, my soul is, is, on, is in pain when, when I experience such racism. Um, it is indescribable unless you've experienced racism from other Muslims who claim to love the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and claim to love this deen and supposed to be in a, 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 a way of life, a creed that is for, for brotherhood and true sisterhood. It is absolutely painful to be seen as the other, to be seen as the outsider, to be seen as nothing more than an abd or a slave. The problem of prejudice and arrogance will continue to be a disease in our society. But we need to fight this and we need to put an end to all injustice and oppression against all humanity. I think the first thing to do it, 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 with anything, it starts with you. It starts with you. You need to educate yourself to, to recognize and realize your views and your values, where you get this kind of thought from, um, not to allow outside influences to corrupt your thinking. It's not hard. If you can put all these packages together for coronavirus, and make people for three months not go out of their house and quarantine, right? A disease? Surely racism is a worse disease than coronavirus. Surely a human being being killed on video is worse than coronavirus. You put all these things in place uh, for coronavirus. You put all these things in place where people can't go to football matches. Because why you treat it seriously? And you back it up with what? Money. And what you do with that, you pass legislation. So it's money, legislation, social awareness. There's boards everywhere saying, stay two meters apart, wear your mask, you shall be fined. So why don't we take the same approach to racism? Uh, we need to be proactive. In what way? We need to have anti-racism or anti-discrimination policy in place within our community. You know, I know very well within some of our communities, we've got this, uh, disciplinary hearing proceedings if somebody does something wrong within the community. But I've not seen anything when it comes to racism and discrimination. So this is time that the leadership of our community should start seriously thinking about this. It starts with education. A community that doesn't read and explore its heritage and its literature, that's a dead community. Imam al-Sadiq, peace be upon him, has a beautiful narration. He says an orphan is not one that is without a father or mother. An orphan is one without literature. If a person does not read about the lives of the great personalities who spoke on behalf of the Lord and the way they interacted with one another, then unfortunately that person will be part of the growth of the disease of ignorance. Combating racism within Muslim communities as well as the global wide scale phenomena is the responsibility of each and every one of us. To start off with, we must be empowered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through dua and sincere submission to Him that He gives us the energy, the tawfiq, the dedication, the time to make this a important objective in our lives. Collectively, if we come together, if we form organizations, if we support or, or existing organizations, change can and will take place. And it must take place. We mustn't be left behind. We mustn't be individuals who just observe or just in our hearts think this is wrong. In joining the good and forbidding the evil must be exercised to the maximum and that is by changing things through our own hands, making a difference in society, leading by example, because our teachings command us to do so. There needs to be a lot of interaction with members of other communities who love the word of Allah, who love the word of the Lord. A lot more interfaith dialogue has to be done uh, to be able to appreciate that people are of different colors, are of different races, are of different backgrounds but they all have the same journey. They have the same journey as us. And even within our own school, 
there needs to be a lot more interaction. For example, different Shia centers can come together once a year as one community, the Pakistani, the Iraqi, the Khoja, uh, the Iranian community and other communities, especially even the converts within our community. They need to be invited to our mosques as Muslims, as Shia. We need more interaction for the sake of fighting racism. Famously, in a quote of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, he said, be afraid of opposing the one who has no defender except God.